Alex Durbin was a tall, lanky man with short, neatly combed black hair, a short black beard, and blue eyes. He had a tattoo on his upper arm that he kept covered most of the time for fear his grandmother would see it, and he generally wore tan cargo shorts and a short sleeve t-shirt. He wore a leather string around his neck with a ring hanging on it. That day was no exception to his general outfit, except instead of flip-flops he wore tennis shoes, and he kept the necklace tucked between his shirt and his chest. The lab didn't have much of a dress code, but there were certain rules for safety. He was running late too, and it was hard to run in flip-flops. When he got to the lab, he saw two young students waiting outside for him. Alyssa Mensch and Dean Crane were both high school seniors, and they were trying to apply for college to study under Dr. Norton at his lab. Alex knew both Alyssa and Dean. They were good kids, and they were both the brightest at their high school. Dean was a shorter guy at only five foot six. He was dressed in slacks, a polo shirt, and polished dress shoes. He also wore an ID on a lanyard around his neck. Alyssa was also dressed for the interview day. She was about five foot seven, blonde, and skinny as a rod. She wore a nice dress that came down past her knees, and she had tied her hair back in a bright blue ribbon. They both looked very professional, and Alex knew they would do well if they got into the college. He also knew that Dr. Norton would need new students when he graduated, and he felt like they would be the perfect fit. By the looks of it, they had been waiting for a while, and Alex felt bad for keeping them waiting. He sighed and walked up to apologize to them when he realized that Dean's face had a large bruise on one side, and Alyssa's jacket was torn and had several ragged holes in it. Dean looked mad, and Alyssa was crying. Alex was confused, and he approached the two kids. What happened, he asked in a concerned tone. I don't want to talk about it, Dean said. Trouble at school? Alex pressed. I said I don't want to talk about it, Dean snapped. Alex put up his hands defensively. Okay, he said. I'll drop it. You guys ready to see the inside of this place? They nodded, and Alex swiped his card and opened the door. He walked them down a long hallway before he came to Dr. Norton's office. He knocked on the door, and it was opened by a tall, muscular man with gray hair and a short, flat-top haircut and well-trimmed mustache. He wore black slacks and a striped button-down shirt and a white lab coat. He welcomed them in the room, and Alex cast his eyes around the room as he looked at the books, the equations on the blackboard, and the scientific posters. His name was on a couple of the posters, and he felt a sense of pride having worked with the professor for so long. Dr. Norton was a genius, and Alex practically worshipped the ground he walked on. The man had a PhD in biology and chemistry, and a master's degree in biophysics. He had spent his career studying immunology, human genetics, and genetic diseases. Originally, he had planned on eliminating as many genetic diseases as he could. But in the past few years, his interest had shifted to genetic enhancement. Alex remembered hearing him describe the problem to him. He said it so often it might as well have been his mantra. Of course he wanted to restore people with crippling diseases, genetic or otherwise, to their normal lives. But the problem with the plan was defining normal. How could you give someone a normal life if you couldn't define normal? Was it 5 foot 9 and 180 pounds? Or was it the muscular 6 foot 3, 240 pound man? And why stop at normal if you could give someone even greater strength and vitality than they would have had originally? To Dr. Norton, he thought it was a waste of time trying to help people become normal. Instead, he wanted to help them reach the heights of their genetic potential through science. It was a waste of time to try and be the normal you when you could be the best version of you instead. Alex remembered Dr. Norton's words the first day they met. Your true self is your normal self. Alex fell in love with the idea, and he had been Dr. Norton's assistant for two years in a row. Now that he was about to graduate, though, he wanted to make sure that his spot went to the best and most capable students, and he knew that Dean and Alyssa were those students. He introduced them to Dr. Norton, and the doctor greeted them with a smile and a firm handshake. They talked for a moment, and Dr. Norton took them on a tour of the lab. He showed them all kinds of equipment. He showed them where the more traditional equipment was, like where they ran the gels, or where the microscopes, PCRs, and centrifuges were, and he also showed them where some of the more exotic equipment was, like the particle accelerator, the vacuum chamber, and the electron microscopes. Most of his solutions were biological, but sometimes he looked for chemical and even nuclear solutions to treat various diseases. He walked them through the entire lab, and eagerly explained what each piece of equipment did, and how they used it in the lab. Dean and Alyssa were very attentive, and even Alex, despite knowing how smart they were, was very impressed by some of the questions they asked. They were about to finish the tour when Dean pointed to the last thing that Dr. Norton had mentioned. What's that? he asked, pointing to a test tube rack with five blue vials. The blue vials had plastic stoppers and a sticker with the contents of the vials written on it. Dr. Norton paused and followed Dean's finger. He perked up when he saw what it was, and he walked over to it excitedly. Ah, uh, this, he said. It's not quite finished yet, but it shows great promise. It's what you might call an orally administered performance enhancer. It's primarily designed to help those suffering from muscle atrophy recover faster. So it helps you grow muscles? Dean asked. Yes, Alex said, incredibly rapidly. It could be really useful, but there are a lot of side effects, including increased chances of cancer. A minor setback, but I think we should be able to overcome that easily, Dr. Norton said excitedly. 
What would happen if someone who wasn't suffering from muscle dystrophy took it? Dean asked. Well, it's primarily designed to stimulate muscle growth, Dr. Nguyen said. So if a healthy person took the serum, they would grow much stronger relative to their normal self. However, the serum is highly experimental, and it is nowhere near being ready for human trials. Dean nodded, and they finished the tour. Dr. Norton left early to go prepare for a STEM dinner hosted by the college. He invited Dean and Alyssa to attend if they had the time, but they declined because they had a homecoming dance to attend. So Dr. Norton said goodbye, and they left in a hurry. Alex smiled at both of them and gave them two thumbs up. Great job, guys. I think you're both probably top candidates, Alex said excitedly. I'll go ahead and take you to the next event, but I have to go to the bathroom first. Alex left. When he came back, both kids were waiting and looking at their phones. He flashed them a smile and pointed to the exit. On to the next stop, right? They followed him to the admissions office, and Alex went back to his dorm. He had to get ready for the dinner, too. He was one of Dr. Norton's best students, and he knew that the doctor would want him there. The fact that the food was better than the normal dining hall food didn't hurt anything. Within 20 minutes, he had showered, shaved, and dressed. He was a little skinny, and he looked a little awkward in his suit, but he did his best to look well put together. He checked the mirror one last time, and after straightening his tie and checking for lint, he left for dinner. When he got there, he was greeted by other students who were at the head of their classes, as well as their professors. Most of the professors were a lot less impressive than Dr. Norton. It wasn't to say that they were dumb or unaccomplished. It was just that Dr. Norton was such a genius that everyone else seemed relatively normal by comparison. The only professors who were even in the same ballpark as Dr. Norton were Dr. Ewell, a nuclear scientist, and Dr. Tora, an organic chemist and the chair of the chemistry department. They were both brilliant too, but were much more interested in teaching than in research. Alex greeted both of them before walking over and taking a seat next to Dr. Norton. Alex, he said in a friendly tone, I was afraid you'd forget. Forget the free food? Not on your life. Oh, is that all this is for you, huh? He said, raising an eyebrow. Well, I can see you have your priorities in line. Alex chuckled, and Dr. Norton rolled his eyes. So is your presentation ready? Alex asked. Dr. Norton's face contorted in disgust like a child eating vegetables. Yes, and it took a lot of valuable time away from my research, he said. I know we need to secure funding, but I just find the whole process so tedious. Are you going to talk about the CRISPR results? Alex asked. Those look promising. Well, they weren't my first choice, he said. But they definitely have the most results at the present. I think we have a serious chance of eliminating two or three major diseases with it within the next couple of years. If one of the donors agrees, funding shouldn't be an issue for the next year and a half at least. That's good, Alex said. What does that mean for research opportunities? Well, it means that your friends would probably get a spot with me. That's great, Alex said. Do you really think they're a good fit? Oh, absolutely, Dr. Owen said. They were both very attentive, and they had some very insightful questions. Of course, it will take time to train them properly on all the equipment, but I think they are going to be a perfect replacement for you. Alex felt pride swell up in his chest with a twinge of jealousy when he thought about Dean and Alyssa taking over for him. That's wonderful, he said. They'll be so excited to hear the news. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, Dr. Norton said. We have to get the funding first. Alex nodded, and he sat back in his chair as the first speaker stepped up to present his research. He was a mathematician, though Alex would have known that without him introducing himself. The man was short and slightly overweight, but his suit helped him to slim down nicely. He wore a black suit with a white dress shirt and a black tie, but his dress shirt was wrinkled and his hair was disheveled and unkempt. He looked like a man that couldn't have cared less about the real world, and just wanted to live in a world of abstract numbers. In his talk, he spoke about his research on graph theory. He explained it to the audience, and Alex tried to understand how it worked, but aside from a few words like vertices and edges, he had no clue what the math professor was saying. Alex almost felt bad for the math professor. Most investors wanted a definite, clear application for research, but math was too abstract to be readily useful for the real world. Oftentimes, it was easier to gain funding if it was connected to another field of research, such as computer science or biology. After the math professor, a computer scientist stepped onto the stage to give a talk about machine learning. He went into detail explaining how AI learned and how they were able to do things like differentiate between images. Then he did his best to explain the practical results of his research, like how it could be used to optimize search engines or develop self-driving cars. The donor seemed impressed, and Alex was intrigued by his research, though he didn't really understand it either. After the computer scientist finished his presentation, they sat through another computer science presentation on quantum computing, then a presentation on stem cell research, then a presentation on plasma physics. There was only one more presentation on modeling and predicting turbulence and weather behavior before Dr. Norton gave his presentation. Alex had almost fallen asleep by that point, but a buzz in his pocket jolted him awake, he pulled out his phone and looked at it. It was a live news story from the local high school. Unsure of what to expect, he unlocked his phone and read the story. After he saw the thumbnail, he nearly dropped his phone. 
The thumbnail on the video read, Local high school attacked. Strange mutant creatures attacked Baker High School. He scrolled down to look at the photos. It was hard to make them out with any level of clarity. They were too blurry, but the monsters looked horrifying. The one in the background was slightly shorter than the average man, though much, much stronger. And it almost looked twisted and contorted. Beyond that, it looked almost like a man, but it wasn't as hairy as most men, and it had long, sharp nails. The one in the foreground looked unnaturally tall and skinny, but it looked like it had a hidden strength to it. It had giant hands and feet, and its entire body was as hairy as a lumberjack's back. The monster's armpits were even more disgusting, with long, thick patches of hair sticking out. Its face wasn't much better. The monster's face was covered in thick brown hair, and it looked like it had a lion's mane on its neck. There was something wrong with their faces. They were unnatural, and they chilled Alex to his very core. He couldn't even describe them. Finally, after long moments of staring at the two faces, he understood. Oh my god, he thought. I'm looking at demons. The short one is lust and the tall one is rage. And it was true. The short one had a fiendish look in its eyes that seemed to crave something. Something wicked and perverse. The taller one just looked angry. But angry was too small of a word. It was as if the face was fury personified. He shook himself. Those monsters are at the dance, he thought. I have to protect Dean and Alyssa. He excused himself from the table and called Dean's phone, but there was no answer. He hung up his phone and called Alyssa, but he got the same response. He wanted to throw his phone, but instead he called their parents. Neither set of parents knew where the kids were, and he wanted to scream. He went back to the news video to see if it mentioned if anyone had made it out. As he watched in horror, he saw no sign of either Dean or Alyssa until he saw a flash across the screen. He had to rewind the video three times to catch the video at the right moment, but he paused the video and stared at the image. It was Dean's ID lanyard. It was blurry, but he knew it was Dean's without a shadow of a doubt. When he saw it, he dropped his phone and sank against the wall in shock. The lustful monster was wearing Dean's ID. With trembling hands, he picked up the phone and rewound it to look closely at the other monster. He wanted to believe he was wrong, but he caught a glimpse of the wrathful monster wearing a blue ribbon in its mane. He gasped in horror as he saw it. He could see behind the hair on her face the contorted, angry features that had once belonged to Alyssa. He felt his whole body shaking, and he wasn't sure what to do, but finally he made up his mind. He ran back into the presentation room, stopping just inside the door. Dr. Norton had just finished his presentation, and he made eye contact with Alex. He discreetly made his way over to Alex, and when he heard what Alex had to say, all the color drained out of his face. Are you sure? Dr. Norton demanded, grabbing Alex by both shoulders and shaking him vigorously. Are you certain? Absolutely, Alex said in horror. How could this have happened? The serum, Dr. Norton said. We should go to the lab. No, Alex said. You go to the lab. I'll try and go stop them. Stop them? He said incredibly. Are you mad? They'll try and kill you. I know them. I'm friends with their families. They'll listen to me. You can't reason with them right now, Dr. Norton said, shaking him again. Alex tore free of his grip. I'm not going to let them hurt anyone, especially themselves. Alex left before Dr. Norton could argue and ran for his car. The high school was 15 minutes away, but he made it in five. He pulled into the school parking lot on two wheels and slammed the car door behind him, running for the entry to the school. Police had made a barricade and were about to usher him back when the school shook with an explosion and he and police were flung backwards. He landed on his back and hit his head. His vision was blurred and he felt dizzy, but he did his best to sit up. As he did, his phone buzzed. He answered it and he heard Dr. Norton on the other end. Alex, he said in a panicked voice, two of the vials of serum, they're gone.